Welcome, Positivists, back to another podcast episode, um, the World of Positivists podcast, coming from the Positive Vibes magazine. So we're very excited because today our speaker is an overcomer who continues to make a global impact, John Register. John Register is a Gulf War Army veteran, a four-time track and field All-American, and a second-time Olympic trials qualifier. However, one misstep in his life cost him his leg and ended both his Olympic dreams and military career. But since his injury, he has won the long jump silver medal in Sydney, Australia, advised four U.S. secretaries of state, and founded the United States Olympic Committee's Paralympic Military Sports Program, which helped wounded, ill, and injured service members use sports as a tool for their rehabilitation. We're very excited to have John Register today, talk about resiliency, COVID-19, disability advocacy, a lot of different topics we're going to delve into. So thank you so much, John, for coming and enjoy the episode, everyone. Welcome, everybody, to the world of positivists. Today, we have uh, John Register, who's going to talk to us about um, the world of disability advocacy and, you know, his passion for it and why he got involved in it. So we're super excited. And um, thank you so much, John, for coming today. Uh, First question, why don't we just start off with who are you? And, you know, for people who don't know you, um, who is John Register? <clears throat> wow, that's a great question, Zane. <laughs> I, I, sometimes I don't know who I am at, at, at various times. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, I, I really identify for those that are, you know, might be seeing this or hearing this as an African-American male. Uh, I have a kind of a grayish beard. Uh, um, I have on a kind of a, a I don't know. I'm colorblind, so I don't I don't really know the colors that I'm wearing. But I do have black shirt on with a, a jacket that's over, kind of a teal jacket, um, and I have some pictures behind me uh, in the in the in the frame. But for myself, I identify with a lot of different hats. That's not my only identity of being an amputee, but rather that when people will come up to me and say, "What do I call you? Do I call you African American? Do I call you?" Black? Do I call you an amputee? Do I go? I'd say, yeah, just call me John. Let's start there. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's really where the conversation I think can start. Right? Is that we want to show up in society as individuals with disabilities, but be recognized for our the the value that we bring into society. So I didn't really know this or understand this as I was growing up on the west side of Chicago in Oak Park, Illinois. I was a kid that played all kinds of sports. You know, I would be called a jock on one side, but on the other side, I was in music. So the jocks called me this, this, this music guy, right? And so I had this, this world that really didn't fit within any, in anybody's box. So I was kind of creating my own little boxes or trying to break out of the box, however you want to create that analogy. And I st- st- kind of stayed with my identity of, of an athlete and went on to become a world-class athlete in the hurdles, mm-hmm. uh, went to two Olympic trials and um, was served in the United States military for uh, six years, went to Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm. So I became a combat veteran mm-hmm. and I was, I was gonna be a lifer. That was my life. I, w- I got married, a young wife, we've been married six years. Uh, we had a kid. Uh, our son is now was at this time was five years old, I think. Um, and I was just, you know, USA Track and Field News picked me to be one of the the, the athletes to watch for the the the, the, the nineteen ninety six Olympic Games, which happened in Atlanta, Georgia. And then on May seventeenth, with one wrong step, everything changed. Uh, May seventeenth, nineteen ninety four, at five twenty nine in the afternoon, I'm on top of the world. I've just run a sub 50 second 400 meter hurdle race. I'm, you know, this four time track and field all American and everything is great. At 5.30, I would misstep a hurdle. I would dislocate my left knee, sever the artery behind the kneecap. And then seven days later, because of the poor circulation would have to make an elective decision, a choice to amputate my left leg. So the world has changed, the worlds are dashed. And I'm thrust into this world of disability and all these thoughts that I had around it that were never at the forefront of my thinking before. So I get to kind of play in this unique space of an acquired disability. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, you know, I had trouble saying the word disability at first. I had trouble with uh, being looked at as the quote unquote inspiration. 
um, and all the things, the buzzwords out there. What do we say? What do we not say? How do we? That's why, that's why I started with my name is John, mm-hmm. because out of everything that happens, I think in the disability community, even though we show up in different ways and different bodies, different costumes, like everyone else in the, in the world, mm-hmm. we want to be recognized by our name because that's the name we were given. Mm-hmm. And so that's first and foremost uh, for, for me. I don't want to, you know, as I, I say to other people, uh, you kind of, you know, tongue in cheek, I'll say when someone's asking me, you know, what do we call you? And I think that's always a topic that always resonates in the disability community is um, I say that we, we don't start in America. We, we, t- we tend to identify people uh, with the, the kind of the adjective, right? So we, we say the, uh, I'm wearing a blue jacket, in France, we might say, I'm wearing the jacket blue. So we put the, 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 the modifier in front of the, the adjective that we're describing over there. And that gets us into trouble around the world. When we're trying to understand different vernaculars and different people because people think about the language different and how they communicate. And so if we just start with the commonality of my name is John, then, because I wouldn't introduce myself in America as, or if someone was introduced to me, they wouldn't say, hey, let me introduce you to my, my, my black friend, John. We don't say that. We wouldn't say, let me introduce you to my disabled friend, John. Yeah. No, yeah. We, we, we say the person first in the first and first language, and we just honor that individual for who they are. And then that means I see you. I value you as a one-on-one a person rather than I'm seeing your disability first. So then I went on to, um, that took me a long time to understand all that. So I will say that. Um, I went on to understand as I was struggling myself with my identity, who am I now? Will my wife still stay with me? Will my son still see me as his his father? Mm -hmm. And what I was meaning by that was I had these fears. Where were these fears coming from? And the fears were not really about my wife, Alice, leaving me. The fears was, am I going to be accepted? Am I still desirable to my wife? Uh, will my son still honor and value me as his dad? Those were the things that were the objects of my fear. And beginning to understand that and creating this new normal mindset, that's when I began to elevate swimming for physical therapy, getting out of the military, making a Paralympic swim team, seeing athletes running with artificial limbs, winning a silver medal in the Paralympic Games four years later after having a leg made for running, and then along the way, developing this um, Paralympic military sport program, Mm. which services wounded, ill, and injured service members for the United States Olympic Committee, Um, and that earning me a Paul G. Hearn leadership, Emerging Leadership Award presented by the American Association for People with Disabilities. And that's my pathway to getting into all this, the long way around, Zane. <laughs> wow. No, that's powerful. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, me, my immediate thoughts. I mean, it's interesting how when you talk about your acquired disability, how it affected your other identities, you know, being a father, being a husband. It's interesting um, that, you know, one identity is going to totally, you know, change how you're viewed in other ways and how you view yourself. Um, and I think somewhat those fears you're talking about, I think, I think those come with the stigma of disability. Sure. Um, um, I mean, I'm sure you know all about that. Could you talk about um, what this, what having a disability means and the stigma with it and why that stigma exists? Yes. Uh, stigma exists because of our inability to honor people and value people for who they are. And so we must make up a story around them, quote unquote, them, air quotes, them, uh, to fit into our box, to make us feel comfortable with who we are around other individuals. It works in any kind of situation where it's race, gender, equity, uh, any, anything you, you can put the, the box. We, we are afraid of what we do not understand. Uh, and I found that whether a person has acquired a disability or a person is born congenital with a disability, Mm -hmm. that there is a meeting point of the two where there's a recognition that because of this disability, I'm being treated differently. Mm -hmm. There's an awakening that happens. And that's where I try to 
marry the two. Um, you know, because well, I was born with it, I was born with mine. So therefore I have this other experience. Yes, you do. Well, I acquired mine, therefore I have this other experience. Yes, you do. But there's a point of why those experiences are so paramount in your life. And that's because usually you're found out and you un uncover and unearth that you're being treated differently because of the disability in either one of those cases. So that's where I generally start with that conversation. So let's unpack a little bit of the stigma that happens, right? So my, I'll start with me because that's, that's what I was understanding. My stigma of fear that Alice is going to leave me and John Jr. is not gonna see me as his father. This, those two things right there. Mm -hmm. Those two things say that there is something going on, on the inside of me that I'm not okay with myself being an amputee. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong with me now because people are gonna see me and treat me differently. Why is that there? Is it because of other people? That's kind of the second step. Other individuals who are believing for me what is now, uh, what, what I'm now, uh, believing for me what is, what is possible for me based on what they believe is, is possible for them if they were in my situation? Is that why they're treating me in this way? And is that because they're trying to keep me in, in, my, in their box of who I'm showing up as now? Yeah. Because I can't accept John for who you are as the amputee. I need to, I still see you as the individual that was out there running track and that's my box of you. So therefore you need to fit back in my box. So I say things like, you're gonna get through this. You're gonna, you're gonna get past, it. you're gonna overcome this disability. But that's not for you, that's for them. <laughs> Yep. Because that's what they would think in that situation. And then finally, societal. Who was I listening to society that made me believe my fears in the first place? Was it when I was six years old watching a movie like Peter Pan? The villain in Peter Pan is Captain Hook. Captain Hook is a amputee, above the wrist amputee. He's dark, he's mysterious, he's scary, he's got that weird looking mustache. But wait a minute, now I'm the amputee. Am I dark? Am I mysterious? Am I scary to other pe people because of this limb? Is that why kids in, in an airport will point out to me when I'm wearing shorts? Hey, mommy, mommy, look, up, look, up, there's, there's robot man right there. And everybody else in the waiting area says, shut those kids up. It's impolite to stare. Where do they learn that from? When that child just has a question, why are you different? So can I show up in that environment and then bring oxygen into that environment, enrich that child's life by answering the question so that the next time he meets a person who is of color or is married, has a disability, they cognitively remember, oh yeah, I remember uh, the gentleman, John, yeah, he, he showed me his artificial leg in an airport one day and man, that was the coolest story I ever saw. Look, tell me a little bit more about yourself, right? So now the conversation has changed. It's different. It's not like what the naysayers were saying, get those kids out of here because if they are confronted with that and they do leave and mom and dad take them down a different aisle of the grocery store or out of the gate waiting area, then now they have, have associated that I am wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. I need to be feared. There is something about me that is not right because my um, my parents, my guardian, the people that have connected with me and, and have pushed me in, in such a strong way that I believe in, that have, are shaping my belief system says that is wrong. So therefore I need to stay away from that. And they become the people that say the next time that happens in their world, oh, uh, we need to, no, don't say that about them. You know, don't, don't, don't even engage. Let's not even see them. Yeah. And we do that and disability and race and gender and whatever we we just don't what we don't understand we fear and when we fear we begin to shut things out so we can close our own bubbles around it look what's happened in our country just on january 6th right a, a day that no one understands each other it's it's, it's culminated to that yeah. we have a lot of social media to blame for we have ourselves to blame for it for pushing ourselves into a space where we just cannot hear each other yeah. and because of that now we have a coup that's being taken place in our country. So those are things we have to, when these things are allowed to fester, we can see over time the challenges that can come from it. But there is a pathway out of it, and we can talk about that as well. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, and I was thinking about when you said, like, when a child would point you out, I, I never really considered children having, you know, bad intentions because they're so impressionable, they don't know anything. 
And so it really is the first time they may see someone that looks like that or appears like that. And so I don't, <laughs> I don't think that they, I think they're just. So, so let me ask that. you this then Zane. Okay. So, all right. So you got the kid little, and it's a three-year-old kid. He's a little tyke. And uh, you have a bag of cookies out, powder cookies. And he knows, she knows not to eat that powder cookie off the, off the shelf, right? Mm -hmm. But they get on the chair, they climb up when you're not looking and they take the powder cookies and they cram them all in their mouth. <laughs> they, they got them all in their mouth and they got that white powder all over their face. And then mom and dad, Zane comes back in the room and says, I thought I told you not to eat those cookies. <laughs> Did you eat those cookies? And what does the kid say? No, <laughs> with the powder all over their mouth. So when is the age that they learn that that is wrong, that I said, don't eat those cookies, but you're gonna eat them anyway. And so I, make, I break it down very simply. And so when people ask me, well, was that a sin, John? <laughs> so I say, so I just say simply back, well, to him that knows to do right and doesn't do it, that's sin, right? And so now you can't you can't escape anything that you kn you know to do right, but you you choose not to do it. There you have it, right? So I I believe we're talking about this in this conversation that those kids, yeah, they they just want to know. That's all. It's coming from a very pure spot, yeah. and we can learn from those individuals, those children that there's a purity to children and, and a naivety to children. And they're asking their mom or dad, is it okay? I want you to see, I want you to discover what I'm discovering. I want to bring you along on my journey. But depending upon the experience that that mom or dad has had with a person with a disability, they're either going to embrace it or reject it. And that's going to make an impression upon that child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, throughout the years, and if they were taught that, or like you said, they were associated with that feeling that, um, of their parents um, of don't associate with that or don't stare instead of, you know, maybe explain to them what that is. And because the child just wants to know. And I think it's weird or not weird, but it's, it's just, it's kind of sad to keep that knowledge away from children to be the best they could be, the most kind they could be, the most understanding and like you said, it creates that stigma. And when they're older, it's gonna, it may heighten, it may not heighten, it may not get worse, but chances are they're gonna perpetuate that and then they may perpetuate onto their kids. And it absolutely that whole, that whole cycle. It happens generation to generation to generation. And somebody has to have the courage to stop the cycle. Mm -hmm. Right. Somebody has to have the courage to stop the cycle. So that kind of leads to this whole secondary thing, this this what I call the after we've identified our fear and we have identified others that might be in our circle and then societal fears that are directing our initial ones, mm -hmm. then it's time we think we're gonna rebuild. I'm gonna rebuild my life now, I'm gonna get back up. But we're rebuilding in our mind on a false foundation. And here's what I mean by that. Had I overcome the amputation of my left leg, I'd have my leg back. People were saying, oh, you've overcome your adversity, John. You have, you've won a silver medal, you have, um, you know, you, 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 you're creating these programs. So you've overcome your adversity. Well, what's my adversity? Your amputation, of course. You're you've overcome the amputation. No. Had I overcome the amputation, I'd have my leg back. So what is it that I overcame? What I overcame was the stigmas that people were placing on me, trying to hold me back to. And a lot of times we don't overcome what we are thinking that we have overcome. If we, if we take COVID, for example, people are saying, we're living in such uncertain times. I can't wait till things get back to normal. Mm -hmm. I guess this is our new normal. But that's not it. The opposite of uncertainty is certainty. I'm assured of what's going to happen tomorrow. When did we ever have the assurance of what was going to happen tomorrow? We never did. Yeah. If we did, we would have known COVID was coming, mm -hmm. right? We would have listened to this. There's going to be a huge change. Instead of now, 
I want my routine to be the same and doggone it, I'm a freaking American and my rights are being violated because I was unprepared. Mm -hmm. Right? So <clears throat> because we are, we don't have a surety of what's happening next, except for the choices that we make and how we respond to them. We think that we have this right to know what's going to happen tomorrow. It's an illusion. Yeah. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We never did know what's going to happen tomorrow. So as we're rebuilding in this phase, then we come to this redefining moment. And I ask, you know, the audience, my audience, when I'm talking, is what do you anticipate getting back that is now holding you back from your new normal mindset? And when you can begin to wrestle with that question and you begin to articulate the fear that you're, you're trying to get back, mm -hmm. now you're almost ready for what I call the, the vision, right? You, you start getting glimpses of what is possible, the opportunities that are before you. And once you see that a glimpse, you, don't have, you may not have the whole vision in front of you, mm -hmm. but you start getting glimpses and your hope and your faith outweigh, begin to outweigh the object of your fear. And when the faith and hope outweigh the object of your fear, that's when you make the courageous decision to jump to the other side, to jump to a rebirth. Wow. <laughs> but it's, it's hard yeah. because this is, the, this is the moment where I can, give you, I can give you the lead up to every single thing that you need to do before and after the jump, but I can't make you jump. That's something you have to do on your own. Yeah. Um, whether, and, and it's not just one jump, it's multiple jumps, yeah. but we'll talk about one jump, right? So I talk about the jump from the, well, from the multiple standpoint, but one jump for me was my identification, right? Of who I am now. And I determined even with the, in the, after making the jump or taking the ampu, taking the amputation, this was going to be harder than what I actually thought it was going to be. So that was a jump making the amputation itself. And then I get over there because I think my faith and hope is like, this is going to be, when I get there, it's going to be easier. But I find out it's a whole lot, it's a heck of a lot harder. The pain is actually greater after the limb is taken off than it was before I had it taken off. So I wouldn't even do with that. But we still hang on to that hope and faith that it's going to be better. So we, we're taking these, these little micro jumps. So I begin to climb up the ladder on this rebirth side, knowing that it's very difficult, it's hard. We don't, we just don't get over our negativity that we've had for all these years and the way that we've seen things in a moment, in an instant. We think we want to because we may, we're courageous to make the jump. Look, I now no, no longer think this way. No, there's a lot of work we have to do to, to make it up the ladder. For me, it was learning how to um, stand up on one leg for 15 seconds at a time. It was... Uh, learning how to manipulate a wheelchair to get to my prosthetic appointments. It was learning how to put on an artificial leg, walking in between the parallel bars. It was then walking on a four bar walker. Then it was walking on uh, crutches, then walking on a cane, then free walking, then getting to the swimming pool, taking my leg off, going for a swim, trying to get stronger, get my body more physically fit. And then back to uh, swimming, to, to running, running to jumping, jumping to a silver medal at the Paralympic Games. The process took six years. And we think we want it now. We want everything now. We want, I made the jump. Look at me, I made this jump. So therefore I'm entitled to all these other things that have come with it. No, there's work that has to be done. And then we, after like I win the silver medal, now I have a resolve. I'm resolute. I know exactly who I am. I'm never going back to the way it used to be. You need to catch up to where I am. And that equals my liberation. That equals my freedom. And that, I think, is the, the journey that each of us are on. And we can be at any given places on that kind of path, fear, that, that pathway from the journey from fear to freedom in our lives at any given time with, it, with different stories, right? One place, one story might be at the end of it. At the another part of my story, maybe I just had an argument with my wife and I'm trying to make the jump to understand and see to her side. So I could be there. 
Maybe it's something that's going on with my, the kids I'm coaching and they have some fears of running over hurdles. So now I'm back over on this side. And in a case we can be on and multiple times on anywhere on the spectrum, we just need to begin to recognize where we are on that, on that continuum so that we can help ourselves and help others clear the hurdles they need to clear in order to embrace their new normal mindset to win the medals in their life. Oh, um, it's to go back to what you were saying about COVID and, you know, how people, a lot of them want to go back to, you know, what normal was, or yeah. maybe this is our new normal. Like you said, that kind of fixed mindset is they're not taking like that leap or that mini jump to creating something new or that rebirth. And so they're kind of stuck into what the past was and how are we going to move forward if we're kind of stuck in the in the past? And even if things go back to normal with things being physical, it's going to look completely different. It's not going to look like what it looked like. And I'm not saying like I'm, I'm for sure know that. Like you said, there's so much uncertainty. So we can't assume that we're eventually going to go back to what that normal was. Things are just so different now. So yeah. I really appreciate you bringing up the COVID aspect and how it relates to your story, because I think a lot of people resonate with that. A lot of people yeah. want to go back to normal. Um, and I think that's really interesting. Um, there's there's a there's a lot of Zane, there's a lot of great stuff that's happened because of COVID. I mean, let's yeah. let's take away from all the deaths, and we know that. I mean, it's just horrible. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of things that people have been get, gotten more clarity. Yeah. When you look at um, the elevation of other issues, people are now paying attention to, for example, people with disabilities, and voter rights, uh, and 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 um, and shots that were you know the vaccinations that are coming, and why are we not getting vaccinated at the same rates of, as others uh, groups uh, in, in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at disparities that have happened in our hospital systems and the way that, that people with disabilities have been treated. And those things are beginning to elevate yeah. where they haven't you know, before. And so now I'm saying, okay, why am I less valuable than somebody else over here? I have a productive life. You know, I am working and competent and all these things. So why is my life worth, you know, worth less to you and your eyesight? Be and that's because they're another. Other people believe for us what we can or cannot do, which is based on what they believe they could or could not do if they were in our situation. So they don't believe that I have a great life because I'm an amputee. So therefore you're lower down the totem pole in my mind. And so somebody else that I think is more deserving that looks like me is gonna get that shot. Yeah. And we fight that. Yeah. And you know, it is like unfortunate that, I mean, this is silver lining, but it's a bit unfortunate that, you know, an extreme like a pandemic is what is gonna bring light to like the disability yeah. community and the challenges that come with having a disability that, that a, a pandemic is what kind of has to shine a light on that. But I mean, I'm not saying, I mean, that's an extreme and I'm saying at least, at least things are getting done. And that's great. It's just, it's sad that I had to come to like an extreme, a revolutionary extreme for that. Yeah. But that's what, that's what happens in revolutions, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the status quo does not give up their status or their, their, I would call their power, right? Because um, we're all fighting for status. They don't give up power. They're not gonna say, hey, we want more power down here. We want more power and elevate us, please, to your level. They're not giving you that. They might throw you a bone here or there or you know, appease on, on a bill or an article or something that goes forward, but they're not gonna give you every right because they don't believe you deserve it. And they have the power. So people who have, and, and power and status are very different, right? Power is, is um, stat, uh, static, it, it doesn't move. I got the power, right? And then status kind of moves around. I can move up or down the this, this scale. So most of the time, people with disabilities and other groups, we ask to get more status from those in power. <laughs> so we just move up and down this, this continuum yeah. while they still have the strings. They're not giving up until the cry becomes so great that now the pervasive demand is so loud that they're forced to listen, whether they want to or not, and have to, if I'm going to appease the pervasive demand, I have to do something to change it, right? But usually power is taken. It's, it's we, we take the power. And, and that, that's an illusion that what's inside of itself as well. But for this, this cause, this argument, power is taken. We take power. And power is not taken by, oh, would you please give it to me? No, it's taken by force. Yeah. <clears throat> and so we've never had the Revolutionary War, the uh, Civil War, 
what we got going on in this, our country right now, it's, it's going to be a war. It's a war because people don't want to give up power. That's, that's why you have these crazy decisions or they can't see. How, how come they can't see that this is nuts? Because they, they like the power they're in and they're not going to give that up no matter how ludicrous something else might seem to them. They love the power too much. Yeah, and it's it's unfortunate that it's reflected in so many groups. So many, so many people have this mindset. Right. Um, it's not just you know like a one shoot one was it one size fits all. It's literally so many people perpetuate these these like messages, and it can be very scary. I want to go back to your other point because it made me think of a, a concept I've been hearing about a lot lately with disabilities. Um, you talked about how you didn't overcome your disability because you still have a dis- you still have that disability. You overcame those stigmas and fears. It's interesting because a lot of people will say you overcame the disability, but well, you still have the disability. It's right. The only reason why you had those fears is because they were kind of put onto you, like they were instilled in you because of what people thought. I'm curious on how do you think you've ever been like used? Um, okay, so inspiration porn. It's, I know it's like a weird term. Yep. Um, for people who don't know inspiration porn, I think it's Got like it. I think it's like when you exploit someone just for their inspirational story and not just really acknowledging who they are as a person. Have yep. you ever experienced that? You think? Uh I don't, I, I know that somebody tried to do it to me mm. and I cut it off pretty fast. I didn't know what it was called, but I, I felt icky about it. And so I didn't engage, right? However, I have seen it on the other side. Mm-hmm. And we see it all over the place because we want the emotional pull to give to the Jerry's kids or give to the, you know, whatever events coming out. We see the disability, the kids with disabilities out there, you know, kind of prop, propagating um, a, a gift to an organization because of that. We also see it inside of the military, right? We see uh, commercials that will come on to say, give to this organization because we're supporting our veterans. So, so it's not a new ploy. Right. Uh, it, it is something that uh, sells, right? And so people are going to use what sell, it works. It's effective because people feel guilty about being who they are. I think the, the bigger question is when we're looking at, um, oh, how do I say it? Uh, like what you call it, like the ins- inspirational porn. How do we, how do we show up as a disability community with everyone else who is kind of feeling this guilt and get us to talk about why we're feeling this guilt? Because if I can get people to say, the reason I want you to give is not because this kid is disabled, but they have a future that is bright and they need to be an economic driver for our society. And we need to give them tools and resources to do that. We need to open up their their world so they get the tools and resources because they have been deprived of that right now. Then that's a different conversation. Yeah. Of just give this, you know, so this kid will have a better life. What's that? Yeah. A better life means I can work. I'm employable. Uh, I'm going to be a productive member. I'm going to get the same opportunities to education. Uh, I'm going to be able to go for grants and scholarships. I'm not going to be treated differently because of this disability that I have that you see. But I want to show up as my authentic self and you're going to embrace me as that and value me as such so that I can elevate um, and pay the taxes and, you know, and have my own space and live the, the most freest life that my, that I'm afforded to. Right. Cause I say that in that way, because there are different degrees that people just have some, some people have to have an attendant. The other part is why is it when we say, I have overcome the disability that people think now I'm going to be accepted into society because now I'm normalized. Mm, yeah, Ableism. Yeah. What it is, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I want you to be able to accept me for just being John Yeah. without anything. So I wear shorts. Uh, I'm, and I, and I, the other, the third piece is, um, so I, I wear shorts, I go out in public, you know, I, I ride my bicycle, I do all these things that 
I still desire to do. I got my cello over here in the corner. I play my cello every once in a while. It's great. So all these things that I, I continue to do, um, I think the, the next piece of that though is why do you need me to look like you? Why do I need, if, if I'm getting around faster in my chair, why then do I need to walk? Why, why is normalized walking? Or why is normalized having sight? Mm -hmm. The limitations are usually placed on us by society, not by the limitations of a person's mind. Yeah. Some mm -hmm. people have attendance. So Stephen Hawking had attendant. He was still brilliant. Yeah. Right. We can we can accelerate. You know, Judy, Judy Human has an attendant. She's the most one of the most brilliant people I know. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's, be, and I know where's Judy, right? Cause she is brilliant. I don't even see anything else. I call on the phone because I want a conversation and, and get some knowledge from her. Mm -hmm. Not because she has, she's Judy human has a disability. Right. Yeah. Or she's a Netflix star or whatever. Right. Or on Trevor Noah. No, I, it's because she has some information mm -hmm. and I enjoy the conversation be, and, and enjoy her wisdom. Yeah. And I think that's where we have to get people to, to understand. And it's not the, the coddling of people, you know, in, in the, the pat on the head or come up behind them and think they need to push in their, in their chair halfway across the street because you think the light's going to change and they need to push because they can't do it for themselves. No, just let me honor you and value you and appreciate you for who you are and what you bring to this world. Yeah. And that, that was the main point and why we reached out and why we reached out to a lot of different people. Lately, we've been reaching out to different people with disabilities, not because they have disability, but because our message is about mental health, positivity, healing. How can you support others and build this community, right? And so we look for people who have powerful messages um, despite anything. We interview anyone, and honestly, anyone who reaches out, as long as they have this powerful, positive story, we want to, we want to showcase them. Um, and so that's why you know we brought you on today and we were going to bring on future people like that because it's not about like the identity it's not about the disability it's not about or being queer or being hispanic or whatever it is it's about like who are you and i love that right. you you talk about that a lot and that's why you know the disability community really emphasizes that people first language um definitely like i learned that in school that we they you know and that makes sense like people first because you want to be known as a person first with someone sure. who has a disability, not a disabled person, which is why that's kind of, you know, kind of derogatory. Some people still want to be called disabled. <laughs> I'm, I'm personally going to say person with a disability unless they really don't want me to, but, um, but yeah, that's how I feel. I think that's really interesting that, you know, as I think if we, you know, see people as who they are as people first <laughs> and not look at their disability and, and, and also looking at people as, that people are different, that, you know, I acknowledge you as a person, but you don't have to look like me or you don't have to look like what a person looks like, if that makes sense. Right. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Good. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> um, I think this is, this is honestly a, an, an amazing conversation. Um, is there any final thoughts you want to share with our audience about you that you maybe didn't get to talk about? Uh, yeah. If you want to find more about me, and um, and follow. I do most of my work on LinkedIn. And so it's just the linkedin.com slash in slash John Register that comes pops my LinkedIn profile up every Thursday afternoon. So today as Thursday on the show, I'll date it. Um, at, th at 312 Mountain Time, I have a guest that's on and we talk about, to them uh, having conversations with hurdlers of adversity inspirers and maximizers of pivotal moments and so we do that um every every thursday uh have a we have incredible guests on so um it's i think all the all the month of january we had on olympians talking about mindset um wow. this month we have we had well of course the first last week was the super bowl so we had um we had a we had a couple of denver broncos on and uh and we had another sports agent talking about who's going to win the super bowl and just kind of some some banter. So we do have some fun shows like that. Um, then we have a I have a Facebook group, and so we talk a lot in the Facebook group 
um, about how we amputate fear. So that's, um, it's, uh, the, I think it's called uh, facebook.com slash groups with an S slash amputate fear. And that will get the folks to that. Uh, other than that, you know, my website, johnregister.com and I'm on Instagram and I am on uh, Twitter um, and YouTube. So would love for y'all to grow the YouTube channel for me, for sure. Grow my YouTube channel. <laughs> I got, I'm trying to get that. I want to get to a thousand. So help me get to a thousand. Thank you all for tuning into this episode of the World of Positivist podcast coming from Positive Vibes magazine. Thank you so, so much, John Register, for coming on today, having the courage to be vulnerable and share your story, your journey, what you've been through, what you've overcome, your growth, and who you are today, John Register, as an incredibly successful person who inspires and motivates so many people every single day. So thank you so much and good luck with everything. We're really excited for you.